Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. I decided we're going to go ahead and get started here. So uh, thank you for being here. Uh, for those of you who uh, may be members and joining us from the community, my name is Jeff Nitch, and I'm director of the Entrepreneurship Center for Music uh, here at CU Boulder. And uh, this is our second uh, COVID webinar. Uh, the first one was really geared just for musicians, uh, talking about remote uh, music teaching. Um, but I'm happy to say that that for this time around, we've got a uh, uh, something that's really going to apply to all of the artistic sectors. And so if you're here and you're not a musician, you are in the right place nonetheless. Um, so uh, thank you again um, for coming, especially those of you who are uh, joining us from the community. Uh, so let me introduce our guests for today. Um, and everybody themselves muted. There we go. Uh, so we have uh, Matt and Kari Landry from the Acropolis Reed Quintet. And this is an awesome, awesome group, um, in large part because it's such a cool combination of instruments. <laughs> we were <laughs> we were actually joking uh, with uh, with my team the other day that that I'm not a big fan of the traditional woodwind quintet combo, and uh, and the, but the Acropolis has a different combo which is just wow, perfect. Um, uh, they've been around for ten years. Uh, they started out of uh, University of Michigan, and they went on to uh, win a number of important competitions, including a gold medal in the Fischhoff competition for the musicians in the room you know what a great award that is uh, they have a robust educational program uh, in the detroit public schools and that's a big part of what they do uh, and they've received lots and lots and lots of grants including the nea chamber of music america uh, the barlow endowment just to name a few and uh, so really, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, step aside here. I will be monitoring the chat window. So if you've got a question, just, uh, just put it in the chat window there. Um, and, uh, and then I will try to uh, jump in as necessary. But basically, we're going to let them present for about 45 minutes. Uh, so unless you have something kind of urgently that needs clarified, uh, hold on to your questions until we're done there. And then we'll have 45 more minutes for discussion and Q&A and, and whatever you guys want to talk about. So um, take it away and welcome to Acropolis. Oh, <laughs> thank you hi, very hi, much. <laughs> um, well, uh, first of all, I, I'm not sure how appropriate it is during this situation to ask neighbors to not make noise. <laughs> because it's like everyone's working from home. So like usually you, you wouldn't just go over to the guy running the gigantic leaf blower and just tell him to stop. Is it okay now? Uh, do people get asked this too many times right now because everyone's working from home? I don't know. He started about an hour ago and he's still going. Um, so we hope within the next like 10 to 15, but so. I, I just, yeah. So anyway, I, I hope you guys can hear us fine. So apologize. For that. Um, yeah, sorry. It's it's great to uh, great to be here, and we've done webinars before where um, you know, in the traditional sense, you just sort of present to nobody, and you hope people are there. It's really cool to see uh, some of you guys, um, and uh, obviously you can see us as well. We even recognize some of the names. Um, Carrie and I teach some courses, and so um, see some some students and things like that. It's just super cool to be here and talk to all you guys. Yeah. So uh, for everybody, uh, just to intro ourselves, um, my name is Carrie, and I'm the clarinet player in Acropolis. Um, Matt and I are very fortunate um, to be able to do Acropolis completely full time. Uh, but when I'm not playing clarinet with the ensemble, um, I have a number of administrative roles um, like Matt. Um, mainly, I help with all of the marketing and design and materials, um, a, lot, a lot of the digital content that we make and then also just a lot of the fundraising and grant writing that goes into it. Matt and I really do that as a team together. Um, we are also married, as you might have guessed from the last name. Um, and yeah, so Matt mentioned that I also teach um, a little course I teach at the University of Michigan, just a very simple music of business entrepreneurship course in the School of Music um, that I've been doing for about five years now. And um, before 
that, I was really involved in um, arts organizations in the Ann Arbor community. So I started off doing internships at some of the performing arts uh, entities. I worked at the Kennedy Center for a little bit, which was really cool. And then I spent kind of the in-between day job years before Acropolis took off um, as a marketing manager for this festival in Ann Arbor called the Ann Arbor Summer Festival. So that's a bit of my kind of admin background. <laughs> Uh, and hello, I'm Matt, and uh, I play the saxophone in the group. Um, so with Acropolis, um, I'm the executive director of our nonprofit, um, and all five members of the group are equal artistic participants. So Carrie and I are co-artistic directors, as are Andrew, Ryan, and Tim, uh, who you can see in all the videos and stuff like that. Um, so as, the, as, a, as a director, um, I serve a lot of the traditional roles that the director of any nonprofit does. So um, anything to do with money and budgeting and the books and finances and uh, cash flow, uh, especially now, that's sort of a thing. Uh, as you can all imagine, dealing with your personal cash flows, I'm dealing with quite a large one uh, over here with the organization. Um, interfacing with our board of directors, um, uh, steering a lot of the projects, just making sure everything's going in the right direction, uh, talking to donors and other funders, helping carry with grant writing, and doing nothing that has anything to do with design or marketing whatsoever <laughs> and uh you will not find me on facebook uh however i i can't stalk you um because i do have a uh a, a ghost profile that i use to uh to message the, the group uh the ensemble members because um it's actually a really good tool for that uh so i teach uh, in addition to doing this full-time so carrie and i work full-time plus right um as any any nonprofit person will tell you but if you run a nonprofit and you're a musician and then you teach a couple of courses. It's um, just really, it's our whole lives. Um, so I also teach a couple of classes at uh, Michigan State, uh, a fundraising one for the first time last year, which was great, all about fundraising and grant writing for artists and all, all sorts of cool stuff related to that. And then also a general, kind of like Harry said, sort of business and music. That's not a real kind of uh, sexy thing. Um, <laughs> sort of entrepreneurship might be a little more, whatever floats your boat. Um, everything that goes to being a great artist uh, that that is sort of helps your performing but isn't the performing right um, and prior to doing all this stuff um, I actually I've held a, a number of jobs um, I worked for four years at uh, the Detroit Regional Chamber of Commerce I worked in um, a large group purchasing uh, office supply affinity program it was kind of like if in the office Dunder Mifflin um, like sold paper like all around the world <laughs> Um, but it was, it was kind of sort of like that, um, but, but it was fun too. Um, I used to be a band director, so I worked for uh, a couple of years as a middle school band director, and my degree was music education. I've been a substitute teacher. I've had a piano studio, uh, did an internship at the DSO, and so all of Carrie and I's combined music and non-music experience has really allowed us to, um, to build a really multifaceted organization that we'll, we'll talk about today. Yeah. So just a, a little bit more uh, to kind of unpack what Acropolis is. Um, so in addition to being a performing ensemble, we are a 501c3 nonprofit that we have been for several years now. Um, we have a budget of about $320,000. Um, and we do typically about 50 concerts um, in a season all around the globe and about 70 to 100 educational outreach events annually every year. As you can imagine right now, because we're not on the road touring, um, it's, it's made a pretty big impact on just who we are and what we do. So hopefully we can get into that later as well. Um, we've recorded four albums. Um, we have a staff, actually. We have two interns and uh, five board of director members in, that are not the ensemble, so that's pretty cool. Um, we sell a bunch of sheet music. We release web premiere videos online that we've actually been doing since 2011. So that was pretty cool to kind of see that we're ahead of the trend there, so that was fun. Um, and then just some other fun things is that we've um, commissioned over 70 pieces for the reed quintet. Um, and the reed quintet is oboe, uh, B-flat clarinet, bass clarinet, saxophone, and bassoon. So we've really enjoyed shaping this ensemble and building it and growing it. When we started, there were probably only about five reed quintets in the entire world. And now uh, there are hundreds in the US alone and several that are popping up at colleges. So it's very cool to be kind of helping this community come to life. And yes, Jeff, I think we agree with you too that we love the combination. <laughs> so um, yeah, so that's just a little bit more about Acropolis. 
And uh, a quick side note, as we start to get into the uh, meat of the presentation, we talk about, you know, what does all this have to do with, with writing grants and, and learning about uh, what grants are and who gives them and why do I want them? and Why are they so difficult and scary and all that stuff? Um, just a quick note to say that um, we're all taking a pause, you know, from um, the crisis that the whole world is in to talk about something that doesn't seem like it has anything to do with that. But we just want to emphasize that um, for Acropolis, the grants are a huge part of our sustainability and our stability. So while much of the musical world is dealing with not having performances and all these kinds of things, Acropolis has been in a really stable situation where um, we've been able to move forward like really not much has changed because so much of our organization is built around really stable funding sources, which we'll, we'll go into some of what those are. So this is a good time to talk about how important it is to build a multifaceted career that, that brings in uh, money from different places because that's ultimately how you get through difficult times. And those of you who might think that something like this isn't gonna happen again, um, you only have to look back 10 years to a financial crisis that put um, many, many people out of work, but it didn't put them out of work in a way that they could come back to. It put them out of work because the economy just sank which is actually almost a worse situation than hopefully we're in now where you can sort of turn this spigot back on. So I hope that this is all actually quite relevant for the time being. Um, and also that is to say that at the end when we do questions, if you'd like to ask a question that doesn't have to do with grants and grant writing, but has to do with the current situation and how you would suggest um, maybe you have a, 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 something you need advice about in your specific situation that you think is applicable to other people, just about the world we're living in today, that's totally fine. And we welcome those and that's okay. Uh, we can sort of talk about this, but we can also talk about other obvious things that you guys might wanna talk about. But that said, uh, this coming week, we are doing a video, a live video on our Facebook page on uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday this week. That and does, Friday. Sorry, <laughs> Friday as well. I don't do marketing. Um, uh, that is going to give um, artists of all kinds some really short, there's much shorter videos than this, like three, four minutes, some real just practical things that we hope you can do now to uh, start planning for a future during and after this crisis. So um, you can check those out. And then Friday, the applications are due for our uh, mastermind program, which is a full week long intense um, uh, workshop that we're doing remotely um, in July. So Friday's the deadline to apply for that. Uh, that would be sort of the um, the big real version of this kind of <laughs> webinar or something like that. Um, so we encourage you guys to check that out if you enjoy um, kind of working with us today. So just go to our website and click uh, Mastermind. You can find out about that. Um, so with that, um, let's kind of get into grants. into grants a little bit. So what we're going to do today is both talk about grant writing and how to write well and how to make a good proposal. But we're also going to start, we'll get there, but we want to start with what puts you in a good position to write a good proposal and to have success with the granting with a funder uh, and funder, you can say funder, grantor, organization that gives money. It's all the same thing. Okay. So you might hear us use those terms kind of interchangeably. So we're going to start today with how can you set yourself up to be in a position to have success writing grants. Um, if you don't do all the thi all these things that we're going to prescribe leading up to sitting down and answering grant questions, it really almost doesn't matter how well you answer the questions. So um, as we go through this, just kind of keep that in mind. So we're going to start real simple today. Uh, what is a grant? Uh, a grant is money that you have to apply for in writing. You can't apply for it with a video chat or telekinesis. You have to write, or in our days, you have to type. Um, and uh, it has, the money comes from an organization. So that's what makes a grant a grant. It's an organization giving you the money, okay? So a grant is like a donation. Um, it's money that's given to you that you can use. Um, it's not a performance fee, uh, but, it, but it, in a grants case, it comes from an organization, not from an individual. So the organizations that give grants uh, can be part of we like to kind of categorize them in three ways. So three places that give out grants, okay? So the first are, though not much in this country, uh, the government does give out grants. Um, 
the uh, federal government gives out grants through the National Endowment for the Arts and uh, Humanities, uh, and we do receive grant money from the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, and then also each state arts council, Minnesota, Michigan, Colorado, um, every, every state also gives out uh, money, a lot of which comes from federal dollars that they receive to re-grant. So those are the big government places where you can get grants. The other two are foundations um, and uh, other nonprofit organizations. So foundations such as the Kresge Foundation, the Puffin Foundation, and all sorts of other private foundations who are basically formed for the purpose of giving out money. Um, and then finally, um, you can get grants from for-profit companies. So most big for-profits have um, nonprofit entities that they create their own foundations. Um, and they give those out, those monies out as grants or as sponsorships, or they call them a sponsorship, but it's really a grant or it's a grant and they call it a sponsorship. Either way, um, so you would want to look also, um, as you're looking for grants, at for profits. Uh, the Ford Foundation in Michigan, of course, uh, in the Detroit area, gives out quite a lot of money uh, for, the, for, for, um, for arts projects and such. So uh, just some other quick hits uh, so you can get a, a concept of what grants really are. Maybe, you've, maybe you know what they are, but maybe you just need a little more context. Um, grants can be applied for whether you are an individual or you're an organization. So you can apply for a grant. There's many, many grants out there as an individual uh, for money to do projects or also as an ensemble and then also as a nonprofit, okay? Uh, grants can be for a little bit of money, $1,000, $500, or they can be for millions and millions and millions of dollars and everything in between. Grants can be a big part of how you make money or they can be a small part, okay? Grants can be really easy to get and they can be nearly impossible. Um, grants are here for young artists. They're here for late stage artists and everyone in between. Um, they exist to help you do almost anything with your art that you can think to do if you know where to look for them. And grants exist all over the world. This isn't a unique uh, sort of thing here in the States, okay? Um, almost every successful artist has received a grant of some kind, um, even if just one grant here or there, or even a grant that they didn't know they were gonna get, okay? It is something that if you wanna have a successful contemporary career in the arts, um, you're probably gonna wanna cross this path or at least try to cross this path, okay? Um, Grant funders also like to see that you've gotten other grants, right? So getting the first grant, and this was the case for us, um, and, and we'll talk more about this, but getting the first grant can, can really be the hardest um, part. Um, uh, you have to apply for grants. A very, very, very small percentage of grants you don't have to apply for. So like an Avery Fisher Genius Grant, you don't have to apply. Um, you just get one. <laughs> you just get one. Um, I'm not gonna ask for anybody to raise hands if you've gotten one. Um, I don't think anybody has. Um, and also grants don't just exist in music and in, in, in the arts and humanities. They exist in research, science, um, philanthropy, medicine, um, education, and the arts and other sectors as well. So um, the common thread for all grants that exist, that, you, that, that are out there, is that the money is given out for a reason. The money is given out to someone or an organization to use it for a purpose. So the grant, the grantor, the funder, wants to see something specific accomplished with that money. Your job as a grant writer, as the person who wants that money, is to tell a story that is clear and compelling and fits with the purpose that they have for their money. Okay, mm -hmm. so just to reiterate, they have something that they need accomplished. Some grant sources, it's very wide. You can, you can accomplish it in many, many ways. Some it's very specific, okay? And they want to know how you're going to use that money, and it's your job to tell a story about what you're going to do and why it's important in a way that's clear, compelling, and is a match for why they give money out, okay? So um, we're just going to kind of start with a little bit of some things that we've done with yeah. grant money. So as you can imagine, 
Acropolis has received grants for such a wide range of things. It really hasn't been, we've gotten a grant for each of the 70 pieces that we've commissioned and you know we're off and running. Um, so one project that we recently got funding for um, from uh, many different sources was for a piece um, by Stephen Snowden for Acropolis and a rideable percussion bicycle built by a Detroit metal fabricator. Um, and it was a very specific kind of project, kind of to collaborate with someone outside of our artistic genre. Um, we've also gotten grant funding to perform concerts uh, within office spaces around the country. Um, we've gotten grant funding to commission high school student composers uh, to write pieces for us, specifically in Detroit. Um, and so that's just a few examples of the wide range of things. We've gotten funding just for a piece on its own, you know, just, just for a piece itself. Um, but what I want to kind of share is that um, Acropolis didn't receive its first grant until 2015. Um, so we started in uh, 2009. So it was several years after we even were formed as an ensemble before we got our first grant. Um, and so that's to say we had zero university funding support from the University of Michigan. Um, and very, very fortunately today, many, many colleges are offering grant funding to students for their brilliant ideas for their ensembles and for projects that they want to do. Um, including the University including of Michigan. Including the University of Michigan now, which does give out quite a lot of funding. But we just wanted everybody to know that, you know, we had zero support financially from our institution in getting our first CD out, publishing all the sheet music, commissioning, you know, our first 20 composers. There wasn't anything like that at our institution that was supporting us. And so the first grant we actually got was from Chamber Music America in 2015. Um, it was a residency partnership grant. So it wasn't even for a commission. It was to do something within our community. And this was actually the building blocks of the uh, festival that we run um, in Detroit right now um, for two weeks every summer, but it was just the beginning, beginning stages. And we went and we played in like five office buildings in downtown Detroit. And that was our grant from Chamber Music America. Um, we applied for many, many grants that we were unsuccessful at. We applied for New Music USA nine times before we received a grant from New Music USA. Uh, the Barlow um, Prize and Endowment many times before we received it. Um, we have not received any Kusevitsky funding and uh, CMA, um, their Chamber Music America commissioning grant. We were successful for the first time two years ago. Uh, so it was a incredibly you know revealing process to kind of see all this just how long it takes to make progress with some of these funding sources but the real key like matt said is once you get one a lot more opportunities with other funders start to open up um, and so kind of the point behind all of this is our first successful fundraising and making money was not through grants um, to be honest and so i think that we'll kind of unpack that whole journey from us today and we have a visual aid <laughs> yeah so we're just going to share screen here a little bit and uh go over to a list here basically of uh the acropolis sort of uh funding uh journey uh you should be seeing uh jeff just poke us if you can't see this can you give me a thumbs up you got the you got the th okay nice great. um so uh you can see grants here are six down on the list so the first way we got money was um, doing competitions, and that's also really hard. Um, I'm not sure if getting grants is harder than getting competi winning competitions. I, it's, it's, it's that's a tough, a tough call there. But um, then we started uh, performing for the public, and at first we just asked for donations at the performances. Um, we started selling merchandise. We did two Kickstarters, one for a uh, our CD, and then another for an education tour in ten schools throughout Michigan. We even were selling sheet music successfully um, before we got any grants. And now we're sort of launching, and I mentioned the Mastermind program, Applications Due Friday. Um, we're, we're, uh, we're now finally launching a tuition-based uh, program, which is yet another um, rev revenue stream. So, um, Carrie, you can go back now. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so if you don't get any grants, that doesn't mean uh, your art isn't valuable and that it can't sustain you. If you do get grants, it also doesn't mean you're going to have a sustainable career, right? If that if that makes sense. Um, so uh, grants should be part of a portfolio of funds, in our opinion. 
Um, so also grantors want to see this. So they want to see that you've made yourself sustainable by getting revenue from multiple places. Okay. Yeah, and so if any project or something that you want to do relies on just one grant or just one funding source, then that's really not a good sign. And that means overall that whatever you're doing is not sustainable. So for us, for the rideable percussion bike piece, collaboration thing, sprocket. Um, so for us, we got money from the National Endowment for the Arts to do the actual collaboration. But we also got money from uh, local Detroit foundations so that we could basically play this piece out in public. We got support from the local like parks and greenway services initiative because it involved biking and uh, you know healthy public transportation and things like that. Um, so because we had all these multiple sprocket points coming in to help support it, um, it was much more likely that we were going to be able to make it happen, right? So you never want to just rely on one grant because if that falls through, you don't get it. You don't want to not do the awesome idea that you have. Um, many artists, I think, have a perception, though, um, that a grant is there to make your project happen. I want to do this project, so I got to get a grant for it, okay? so. What you want to do instead is think beyond a granting source and think about how the project fits your whole, either you as an artist or your, your, uh, your business and your organization. So um, in, in our case, um, we spent a long time getting funding for projects on our own before we uh, started getting grant funding. Uh, we were hustling to find money you know, anywhere we could, um, which actually made all of our projects really practical. And it, it meant that people had to value them. The audience had to value them. Students that we worked with and the world at large had to had value them directly for their meaning and for their power before we could go to someone who would say, outside of all of this, outside of the people who had actually impacted, in order for us to go to that, that, that organization and, and for them to say, we put our stamp on this, we think this is important, now we're gonna give you money to support it. So this is just sort of the journey that we went about. If you are lucky enough to get grants, and we please do go for them now. Um, if you are, if you are, I shouldn't say lucky. If you are keen and smart enough and well prepared enough, as we're going to talk about here just in a sec, to to get grants early in your career, that's awesome, and that is going to actually help you jumpstart and create significance in your projects. That's going to allow you to get the other funding. But no matter how you go about it, make it make it well rounded. Okay. Yeah. So right now, um, grant revenue makes up about a third of our budget, and we thought it would be interesting to just share exactly what those specifics are. So um, we receive about twenty thousand dollars every year from a very small family foundation um, uh, called the Angel Foundation. That's actually based outside of Chicago, but uh, really focuses on um, projects that are happening in Detroit. So it's very, very specific to us. And so that's another just example of that. It's not, you know, Chamber Music America giving us a lot of money every year. It's a very specific funder that fits with our mission very, very specifically. Um, the NEA um, has been giving us around ten to fifteen thousand um, dollars in grant funding um, for the past three years, which is really cool. Um, we get around twenty uh, grand from the State Arts Council in Michigan, um, and then beyond that, we get around three thousand dollars from the Aaron Copeland Fund for Music. Um, the Ampion Fund and the Ditson Fund. Those are all really artistic and contemporary music-based um, funding organizations. Um, we get around $5,000 from the DTE Foundation in Detroit, but that's really a national, you know, for-profit organization. Um, and then around um, $10,000 from another foundation in Detroit called Kresge. Um, and then really the, you know, remainder of the gap is ten or twenty thousand dollars rotating between the like the high end kind of artistic grants, your Barlows, your CMAs, your New Music USAs, and things like that. But those are not guaranteed funding sources 
for us every year, like the Angel Foundation or the Michigan Arts Council is, for example. So all of that um, is about a third of our revenue. And then all the other pie pieces between booking and everything else that we do is kind of built around that. So let's just pause for a second, kind of um, do a quick little recap here on what we've been going o over uh, to this point. Um, Carrie, would you be able to share yes. that one? Sorry, I was that was me stalling uh, uh, so you could pull up the thing again. My bad. There we go. All right. Here we go. So um, sort of a summary up to this point, okay? Grants um, should never really be relied upon, but they should be capitalized on, okay? Um, and... Uh, one another way of kind of saying what we were saying before is that grants are great and they're really really important to building legitimacy and sustainability and they can be really important just to making something happen in the first place but you should always first and foremost and this is what grantors want to see okay always first and foremost consider yourself and what you love to do and the people who you want to do it with or for foremost when creating your career build it around those things okay so grants are not required to have a long sustainable career, but they are certain, certainly a really important and can be a, a really important component to sustainability, okay? And then uh, again, um, get your revenue and your money from multiple places and uh, never create something because you see a grant opportunity, okay? <laughs> Use grants to inspire ways of telling the story about what you do but uh, never look at a grant and then say, well, that makes me think of something I can do. If it does, cool, but then you need to really go back and check, is this something I organically wanna do? And are these people who I'm gonna do it with or for organically really, really important to me? Yeah, and so if you feel, you know, even the slightest bit uneasy about the fit of the grant, um, then it's really likely that you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't waste your time on it. Even if you have that, you know, kind of rumble in the pit of your stomach and it doesn't seem like it's a good idea that you should follow your gut and take the instinct on that and not waste your time on it. And in our experience, you know, we really only started receiving the grants that we felt like was an absolute perfect match. And that was what got us in the door to start, you know, actually forming relationships with these organizations is because we felt that the fit was so good. So even going back to, you know, the first grants that we received, we had been doing tons and tons of commissioning, but our commissioning wasn't, you know, centered around our grant funding and it wasn't creative enough. It didn't involve our community enough and it wasn't collaborative enough for a lot of these funding sources. So we found that first fit from the Chamber of Music America Residency Partnership Grant. And that not only pushed us you know, to seek out other funding opportunities, but it pushed us as artists to be more inclusive and collaborative and stretch you know, what we were interested in doing and what we were capable of doing. Great. Um, so what we wanted to um, do is uh, talk a little bit about um, starting to find grants that work for you and the right grants for, um, for, for you and for the work that you're doing. So we're showing up here uh, on the screen now a few different examples of organizations that grant money to artists and then the uh, stated objectives of them giving out that money, okay? So it's the Aaron Copeland Fund uh, and their objective is to, to support performing and presenting organizations uh, and, and, and importantly, uh, those who encourage and improve public knowledge and appreciation of specifically serious contemporary American music. Okay, uh, they have a separate separate fund. This was their operating support. This is their recording support. Okay, wider exposure for the music of contemporary American composers. Okay, develop audiences for contemporary American music and um, previ or previously unreleased contemporary American music reissue. So these two right here uh, for the, the first part are very specific. You wouldn't wanna go and find these and say, well, maybe I should start working with contemporary American composers. <laughs> you should probably uh, say a few of you on this webinar saying, oh, damn, I didn't know this was out there. I do all this stuff all the time. Um, I might be able to make a compelling case because I really fit with this funder. That's what, that's what you should uh, be trying to do, okay? Uh, this one's a little bit longer. Um, but it's, it's just another really good example. So the classical commissioning program, we received a grant through this to work with Jeff Scott, 
uh, uh, French hornist and composer with the Imani Winds. So um, provides grants to US-based presenters and ensembles uh, who do and it's chamber music and contemporary music. And then specifically here, a couple years ago, they started um, an initiative where their work focused on this acronym Alana, African Black, Latinx, Asian, South American, and so on and so forth, women and gender nonconforming composers who have historically been underrepresented. And then most importantly, as you can see on the bottom here, um, they award a majority of the grants to applicants who apply with an Alana, women or gender nonconforming composers. So essentially, uh, we've been giving these grants out to white men for a long time. You can apply with a white man and if it's compelling and we think it's all yada, 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 you'll get the grant if you're competitive, et cetera, et cetera. But here's what we're focusing on. So it's up to you to figure out if you have a project and something organic in the nature of the work that you're doing that fits with this. Uh, and so for us, it did because we had been talking to Jeff for like 30 years about writing a piece. So uh, anywho, um, off, off we went from there. Now, Carrie mentioned the um, residency partnership program. So this was the very, very first grant that we yeah. got. So um, this uh, supports uh, chamber music and residency projects. So specifically that are not part of regular concert series. So for this, um, we actually kind of came up with an idea that we felt fit this because we had been doing so many different kinds of non-traditional performing. We said, what's kind of a really cool non-traditional performing thing that we've already done that we can kind of create a little something that jives with that, but that builds it out a little bit more. And so we had performed in uh, train stations, parks, uh, office spaces, hospitals, grocery stores, farmers markets, everywhere you can perform. And we really thought that the um, performing in office spaces was, was really unique and interesting, a really interesting kind of um, person to introduce to contemporary music. And so we built this idea of a, of a, a tour of offices in Detroit um, around that idea. And it, we kind of felt immediately when we kind of hit on that idea that we were going to get this grant. And, and for being the first one we got after many years of trying to get grants, um, it just fit so well. And that really emphasized to us um, how important um, that fit is when, uh, when finding a good granting source. Yeah. Um, so uh, we, in kind of continuing on with this theme, uh, we receive a grant from DTE um, to do free outdoor concerts. So these are all things that Acropolis does, right? We perform contemporary American music. We have operating support grants from these uh, organizations we mentioned above. So Aaron Copeland and then Carrie Menson, Ditson and, and Amphium for things that we do. So grant preparation requires you to understand the ways you impact people uh, and then uh, searching for grants based on that, okay? Yeah, and so I'll just kind of say that, you know, if you don't want to be known for doing residency work <laughs> or you don't want to be known for commissioning, you know, contemporary American composers or whatever it is, don't just come up with an idea and then apply for that grant because you like so desperately want that $3,000 or whatever it is. You don't actually want it that badly. So you shouldn't change who you are um to really fit the grant if you can't come up with an idea that really meshes with what the grant is and what it means then um, you shouldn't apply for it and that's that's the end of that um, so on the other hand you should be actively seeking out grants that fit with you in the various ways that you can categorize what it is that you do and the more ways that you can categorize yourself rather than just acropolis is a chamber music wind ensemble right if that was the only lens that we viewed ourselves through then we'd be really limited as to what we could apply for and seek for funding um, but if you can broaden how you view yourself and what you care about and you start to expand who you are and what you are as an artist then you can find a lot more funding opportunities that support all of those different little wedges that are who you are and so the best way that we found to really do this is to really just get online and look at other peer organizations or people that uh, you look up to that you feel like they're doing what you want to be doing and then just go to their website and see who's supporting them. I mean, every single um, you know, ensemble that is very similar to us has a page on their website where they have to list all of their supporters and you can literally just go down it 
and see where everybody is getting all the funding from. When we started out, that's exactly what we did. We looked at where's 8th Blackbird getting their funding from and where's the Prism Sex Quartet getting their funding from. And then we just went to every single one of those funders and tried to make a case for ourselves. And it worked. So, um, so you should be able to find people that you are inspired by and see where they're getting support from. And, you know, we really don't have a lot of success from just going down a big, massive grant database and just looking at all of these different options or anything like that. We've never found success that way. Um, and we really, really encourage you that if you can see someone else who's your contemporary and there's proof there of that funding, then that's where you're gonna have your best success. <laughs> In our experience, um, grant success is um, based mostly on um, how you prepare for the grant uh, application process. So we're gonna break out the two parts of this here. Um, and we'll talk about the sort of preparation, which is 90% uh, of, of kind of what goes, what goes into this, okay? Um, so as we, uh, as we go through here, uh, we talked about a lot of these things already, but before you get into writing a grant, make sure the project comes from you, make sure it impacts people, okay? Um, make sure, and this may also seem a little bit weird because you might be thinking, well, the grant money is what allows me to execute the project. That's really most of the time not going to be true. Someone who wants to give you money wants you to be prepared regardless of their money to execute the project and execute it now. Not, well, if I get your money, I might be able to do it. That's just not how it works. You have to be much more confident and you have to have much more reality to what you're doing in order to receive a grant, okay? Um, it's very important before you even begin to apply that you're doing something where you can prove you've done the same or similar work in the past, okay? Very important to creating legitimacy that you can accomplish the goals and uh, activities of, of what you're gonna be doing, okay? Um, obviously, matching a funder's priorities, and also that in before you write your grant, you've spoken directly to the grant funder. You might think that grantors are, they live in a magical palace somewhere uh, that's impenetrable, except if you cross a magic moat uh, <laughs> that you, you know, you gotta go like to moat school uh, and figure out how to cross it, okay? Not true. Uh, write an email, pick up the phone, call them. Grantors want to tell you the secrets to getting the grant because they wanna give the money to the best applicants. They wanna help you, okay? Some things, I'm gonna just skip down just for a sec here. When you're talking to the grantor, here's some things you want to do, okay? <laughs> yeah, so when you actually pick up the phone and call them, um, you may not even think that like, I could call someone at the National Endow Endowment for the Arts right now, but like you literally could. And His so- His name's Court, he's great. He's great. Um, so you, you really just wanna pick up the phone and call them and you wanna ask them these questions. You say, here's my project, here's what I wanna do. Does this fall in line with your organization and what it funds? And if it doesn't, they're gonna tell you and they're gonna tell you why, which is huge. And then if it does feel like it fits there you can ask them is this a competitive idea you know do i stand up against all the other people and all the other ensembles that might be applying for the same thing and you can point blank ask them should i apply with this idea and they will legitimately give you an honest answer they're not going to just say yes um, you know, they, they're not trying to get you to apply for anything else like money based or anything like that. You know, they're going to be very, very frank with you. Um, so you should ask them very specifically, you know, my project costs X. Um, how much money should is appropriate for me to ask for you um, as a funder? And they're going to tell you, you know, if the project costs X, you should apply for, you know, $3,000 or something like that. So they'll be very helpful and very specific that way. And ask them literally any other clarifying questions about the grant so that you can answer every question very, very directly and specifically. And then when you have the grant completed, you can share parts of it with them and you can say, is anything missing from my proposal? Um, and 
could you also maybe send me an example of some funded proposals in the past so that I can compare um, my project to something that you've awarded successfully? And they will do that. So um, really, they're not like secret keepers in any sense. They're the most wonderful people on the planet that really just want to help you um, make sure that you're doing the right thing and help you in the best way that you can. Um, so if you, all right, so, um, you feel, uh, you feel prepared. Um, it's, uh, it's time to, uh, do a grant. You've talked to the grantor, you feel good about it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's time to do this 10%, you know, here and write the grant. Now, uh, this isn't, um, how important these two things are. So like preparing for a grant and writing a grant are both equally important. Uh, you can't have one without the other. Uh, There's a little more of a deno denotion of like the time. Uh, I think that that goes into it. And uh, for us, we emphasize everything in the preparation because that was the preparation that really enabled us to find not just one good grant, but what built an entire system for us of understanding what we do and how it makes an impact such that we could apply and receive many, many grants. Now for us, we focus a lot on this 10% that we're going to talk about now. Um, because we've done and had so much practice at the rest of it. Okay, so you want to write a little bit uh, and you want to use your writing because remember um, that writing is required for grants. Uh, getting a grant is about writing for your life, <laughs> <laughs> writing for the money. Okay, and so you, if you don't consider yourself a good writer, now would be the time to get better at it. Um, you don't have to be a, a great uh, spinner of a phrase. And in fact, the better you are at that, the worse you may be at writing grants because writing grants <laughs> is not about getting an A in short story class or essay class. Um, it's about saying exactly what you mean to say and saying the right things. That's all it is. Um, I have read grants for organizations that want to give out money and um, I have never really once thought of how good the people were at writing. I've only ever thought about if I could tell what they were trying to say. That's all you have to do when you're, when you're um, writing grants. So let's just kind of go down this list a, bit, a little bit. Um, a lot of these things might seem a little bit counterintuitive, okay? You're not applying for money because there's something you hope you can do. Just don't talk like that. Be confident, I'm gonna do this. Here's why it's important all your voice and your tone should be confident. Just, if you're writing a grant, take some sticky notes and put them all around the room and just say, this project will happen, I'm confident it will happen. And don't let yourself ever stray from, from, from that when you're writing. Make sure that that confidence is in everything you're writing, okay? That you can do it and that it's important. You can do the project you're asking money for and that it's important, okay? Um, write as if it's going to happen. So. We will be doing this, this, this. Um, not, don't, don't, don't. I mean, not only is it more words, but it's just not confident. Don't say we would like to do this. Here's what we're going to do. Okay, okay. So again, that might be strange, even because because the project may be really may be dependent on the funding. Doesn't matter. Okay. As the grant reader, I want to know what you're going to do, not what you'd like to do. Okay. Um, so, uh, so yeah, you. This is another sort of uh, strange concept. Took us a little bit to get our heads around this one. But the grantor wants to know that you need the money, but at the same time, that you can do the project even if they don't give you the money. So they want to see that you've got a system where you've got other money in place. You've done this kind of stuff before. Even if I didn't give you this money, I feel like you could probably survive and go do this project. That helps me as the grantor say, yeah, so if I just give them this 20% of the project that they're asking for, it's really going to help them out. That's kind of the position you want to be in when you're writing, okay? Um, and then, uh, yeah, funders don't want to be the only reason your project happens. Um, now, this third from the bottom here, don't make stuff up. Don't say even the, even the slightest bit that, you know, don't, don't think aspirationally about what you, what you think they might want to hear you're going to do. Write about things you're going to actually do. And don't, okay? don't actually think that they know something about you that you know, but then they don't know, right? So it's only what you share in the actual grant. 
you might think in the back of your head that you're leaving something out or that they actually think that they already know this about you. You should assume that they know, you know, squat about your project, your organization, and you only have that space right there to talk about it. So absolutely don't talk about anything that you're not gonna do or it's on the fence about actually happening. And then use the actual grant ex it itself to basically show how you are the person, the only person to make that project happen with all of the credentials and everything that you have. And then show how this is what's gonna happen actually after the project is done so that you're not thinking about it in just a vacuum as well. And I would say that uh, you might find yourself in situations where the grant proposal does not specifically ask you to talk about your prior experience or evaluation or the future. These are things you really wanna try to get in the best you can, even if briefly and even if not asked for. This would be a kind of an exception to the just answer the questions rule that we're gonna talk about here in a minute. Um, but these are things that, that you wanna cook them into how you're answering the questions. These are really important components to um, how you go about making a compelling case. Um, so we wanted you guys to get a little bit of a chance to actually sort of write a grant right now. Um, so we're gonna do a very short uh, free writing exercise here. So um, this really works well with, uh, uh, I don't know if you guys can see us still or if it's just a screen, but I'm holding up a pen. <laughs> Um, it's got ink in it and it's the ink comes out the end and it, and it writes on parchment or paper or your hand or a napkin like JK Rowling or anything else. Um, if you'd like to type, that's cool. Um, but, uh, but writing down is great as well. So when you're writing about your work, um, what we find helps is to get all your ideas out at the beginning of the process, because while at the end you want a very compact and concise product, you don't want that product to be leaving things out, leaving out any inspirations or personal anecdotes or um, really compelling raison d'etre or exigence, which is the sort of so what to why you're doing your, pro your project or stories or anything like that. Um, so you may end up cutting a lot of these initial ideas that you put down but we like to start with a big piece of paper or a whiteboard or a Google Doc or something that just gets everything that we can think of about this project down. So what we want you guys to do, and I'll start a little timer here, um, is take two minutes and just do a free write. And a free write is literally just you just write and you can't stop. Okay? Brain dump. <laughs> um, of anything that comes to mind. And we want you guys to write about a project that you'd like to do. So if you can't think of anything right now, um, think simply, even if it's just like a concert you want to put on, make it something you need to go out and get money to do. Okay. Hopefully you guys are here because you have some big ideas and you want to get money for them. Okay. So think about what that uh, project's going to be. And we're going to start a timer, give you guys two minutes. Here are some prompts. So if you want some things you can, um, you can write about, but just see where it goes. If we have time here, we'd actually like to ask if there's anybody um, who'd actually like to um, share, not your free write, but we're going to distill the free write down into like a sentence or two. So um, if, if you'd like uh, just to get um, a, a little, a little uh, practice at writing and then distilling it, and then we, we'd love to just hear some of what you guys are doing. Um, so let's go ahead and start the timer. Ready, set, go. Off you go. <laughs> write for two minutes. Don't stop. <laughs>
Kind of right, Stanley. All right, we all know what that sound means. Um, it's time for you to turn the hose off that you left on in the backyard, or go get the um, get the muffins out of the out of the whatever, or wake up from your nap, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, we were uh, chatting with Jeff a little bit, and we want to kind of keep things moving for time's sake, so that we have plenty of time for questions, and we have so many people here that I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions. So um, I lied. Uh, you're not going to share, um, but here's what you can do. Um, take your um, free write when you have a second. Um, and the next step is to basically distill it into bullet points. And then after those bullet points, maybe 10, 15 bullet points. And then after that, get it down into two sentences that convey the essence of the most important parts. Okay. And this is essentially a process that you're going to do throughout answering all the questions in a grant. Every single question, start with your thoughts get down to the most important points, and then turn it into an actual paragraph. Um, the vast majority of the time when you're answering questions in a, in a, in a grant, you, you need to be sort of doing it in, in paragraph form, so. Yeah, and as just um, a little anecdote to that, this technique works not just for grant writing. Um, we find it works really, really well for accomplishing a lot of tasks and getting all of the ideas that are out of your brain um, out of your brain and onto a piece of paper and then you could actually see it all and just look at it and then see what is actually most important. But the act of, you know, getting it out um, is really what helps you kind of step away from it and see it as at a distance too. We're going to um, close the um, sort of presentation part here with a really quick hit list of a lot of the other writing techniques that we found um, we've learned have been really helpful with um, getting grants, basically. <laughs> um, so I think Carrie's gonna start with sort yeah. of one of our favorites here. Yeah, so um, this is a hard one for me because I come from the marketing world. Um, so you really don't wanna write in flowery nonsense marketing copy that you think a lot of people want to hear. Um, so you really just don't want to create hype or fluff or flower around um, whatever it is that you're saying. So use very, very, very few adjectives, um, if any at all, which is completely the opposite for when you're writing marketing lingo, when everything is exciting and extravagant and beautiful and all that, you know. So um, it is the complete opposite style of writing. <laughs> Yeah. Um, in other words, as, as regards hype, uh, don't talk about why the project is so important. Um, talk about the things you're going to do that imply crystally clear the importance of the project. Talk about the things that create that importance. That's what you want to do. Okay. So um, one, one small thing is um, just something to have in your arsenal transition words like the word therefore um basically that's a word that allows you to say we are going to do this 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 therefore and then you can talk about the impact therefore is a really really strong kind of big but strong word think about words that are strong not words that are fluffy yeah and so overall in in a lot of these grants you can use headings you can use bullets you can link your text you can make it so that the grant itself is so easy to read and navigate. Um, and so it's really important to vary the sentence structure length as well. You really don't want to have like this giant paragraph text, but really try and be conscious of how, how long sentences are followed by short, very specific sentences and how you can break up the structure in that way. Um, really remove any remotely unnecessary words. This is a hard one for me, but just go through and just get rid of 
just try and get rid of half the words in a sentence and see if it still makes sense. Um, and like we've been talking about it, answer the question very directly. Don't put any type of qualifiers before answer things. It's just answer it incredibly directly. <laughs> so I've read grant proposals before that are for a lot of money for some organizations that really need them. Um, and as a grant reader, a reader of proposals, and maybe I'll read a proposal of yours someday um, as part of a you know, board of some organization or whatnot, um, I have some very specific experiences with grant proposals um, that don't seem that I just I just can't give money to. Okay, so the biggest thing is when a grant proposal doesn't follow directions. Okay, so remember that people that read grant proposals read many of them. Okay, so when you read a lot of the same thing, the whole point of having uniformity to what you're asking everybody for, all the thousands of people who apply or hundreds or whatever, is so that everybody has to follow the same process. You are not special, follow the directions exactly so that, and the, the people who follow the directions the best stand out. They really do. It's great. Okay. <laughs> Anything that has remotely poor grammar or typos whatsoever, just, it just, it, it, uh, it doesn't technically matter. It's actually important to note. Um, if you do everything perfectly and you've got a little bad grammar and typos, it's actually really not that big of a deal, but it doesn't help. Okay. Um, I've had a lot of trouble giving money to organizations that leave something out. If you just forgot about something bad, okay? Um, I have a pet peeve about budgets, okay? Talk to the grantor about what they wanna see in the budget that accompanies your grant proposal and follow the guidelines exactly, okay? Uh, another big thing is when I simply can't see in my head what it is you're doing. I've read some grant proposals before and I get to the end of them and I just, I sit there and I say, I'm going to now describe back to you what you're going to do with this money, what your project is, and I can't do it. So this goes back to getting other people to read your proposals. You need to have other people read your proposal and tell you what you're doing, okay? Because <laughs> if they can tell you what you're doing, then the funder is likely going to be able to see what it is you're doing, okay? Um, and then uh, lastly, and this is almost hilarious, um, I've seen situations where people are actually answering the wrong questions. They're using old guidelines. They're just make sure you are completely up to date with everything <laughs> that you're looking at. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it's very likely that the funder understands the importance of what you're doing. We're all in the arts. We're all making a difference. If you have to choose between explaining why it's important and just telling me what you're gonna do, just go for the what you're gonna do. Go for what you're gonna do and how you're gonna make it happen, okay? And then finally, um, read the questions and figure out what was the funder, what, what were they sort of like, what was the voice that they're sort of expecting this to be answered in? So if they fund uh, youth activities, for instance, um, don't say anything that's like overly artistic about the music and talks about how great the music is because it's more likely that this is sort of being directed toward education minded people. So just keep in mind as to like who the audience is for, for these kinds of things. Okay. And for example, you know, like the Aaron Copeland fund, we mentioned that they fund, you know, contemporary American composers. So you should use those three words a lot in your grant. <laughs> Or at least use them once and then maybe put a like acronym. Yeah. CAM. You know, uh, and we actually we actually do that. And and I don't I don't mind reading when I read grants, I don't mind seeing little tricks like that to cut down on word count because um almost all grants will have word counts on how many words you can write. And as long as you know it's still easy to read, it's it's no no problem there. Um so um yeah, lastly, there are some grants um that require that are really, really competitive. And you, these are probably the ones you're going to fail at the most because they're just so, so competitive. A thousand, 2000 applicants for 50 or a hundred pots of money, okay? In that case, you actually have to talk about your work in a way that makes it like better and more important than someone else's, okay? And I don't really like that personally and we don't really apply for those kind of grants um, really at all. But if you find yourself in that situation, 
and you, you may, we like to think about expressing why your work is potentially more important than someone else's using uh, statistics and measurements, very, very quantifiable statistics and measurements about the people you're impacting and the work you're doing um, to help make the case firm, but not overly emotional and helps distance you from having to um, be too subjective about your own worth of what you're doing. Just talk about the numbers and the measurements and the statistics behind it. And then secondly, if we're in one of those situations, um, remember the personal connection that you have to the work. Remember to, to include why it's important to you, your career, and the journey you've gone on as an artist, because that makes it unique and separates it from everyone else by default, okay? <laughs> and so just a couple last super simple things that we do is legitimately like print out your proposal on real paper and like read it and mark it up in that way. Uh, get other people to read your proposal. Both of our moms read pretty much all of our grants. They're terrific. And, terrific and, writers. And they don't know people. what the heck any of that stuff is, but they can mark the crap out of it and let us know none of this is clear or I have no idea what you're doing. Um, and so get people completely outside of your world to look at your grants. And um, this is really important for if you're in an ensemble and you have to work on these things together, right? Um, you, I would really encourage not just one person in your organization or entity to write the grant itself. Figure out how you can break it up, how you can delegate all of the different things, and how you can help each other through the draft stages of all of the parts of the grant, because the more eyes you get on something, the better and the more clear it's going to be at the end of the day. And the last really weird thing that we do is we'll literally read Wait. it out loud. You know, we'll make sure that it makes sense when we read it out loud. <laughs> yeah. Um, Carrie, would you bring us back over to the, yeah, the, uh, I the PDF that. real quick? And we'll close out uh, the presentation. Um, so we're going to send this um, PDF around. Uh, we should be up now, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so you can check out, uh, these are the requirements. For a, this is the, the one of the big questions, 4,000 characters that we answered for a, a National Endowment for the Arts grant that we were awarded. And then this slide here is the question again, and then part of our answer, not the entire answer. So we wanted to give you guys some actual documented evidence of our ability to do the things we are telling you to do. Um, so uh, we'll send this PDF around and you can check this out. Uh, the highlights are not part of the grant. I put those in now. Um, and uh, also this page here of just some final takeaways. So basically throw the rest of the PDF away and just read these and you'll be uh, good to go. So uh, that brings us to the end of the um, end of the grant uh, part of this. And, yeah, and um, we can dive I'm into some questions. Sure, there are some and... questions. Uh, if you didn't put a question in the chat or I don't know if we're gonna actually say them out loud or whatever, now's the time to go ahead and do that. And um, We'll be here as long as you guys want to be. Yeah. Put it, yeah, put it in the uh, chat so that uh, we're not all talking over each other. <laughs> that first question is always slow. Thank you for the hobbit, yeah. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. <laughs> no admittance. And the gurgling you heard during the free write was one of our dogs. Um, grumbling very he's, low. He's a grumbler. Slight. Yes, he's a grumbler. <sighs> I wondered what that was, I have to yeah. say. And there uh, is somebody, right. having a, somebody's having a really difficult time writing or something. I'm not yeah. Sure. Right, right. Right. <laughs> okay, here we got a, a couple of questions here. Are you familiar of any grant organizations that donate to secondary education? Uh, yeah, well, I know that in Michigan, um, the State Arts Council has a fund, a grant fund for, set for schools um, of all grades, but including secondary, to apply for grant funds to support residency work with artists. So the artist and the school work together on the application, and then um, the school itself presents it. I would presents the application, I would start with your state arts council because almost all will have some form of money that's granted to schools to incorporate the arts into professional artists into schoolwork. 
that is the, the other thing I would say is um, as a secondary education organization, I, I believe, you know, that you're eligible for, for, you know, all, all education grants. Um, and uh, you'd also be eligible for a lot of arts and cultural and humanities grants and things like that. So I would just also start by approaching it, um, just approaching it from that lens. Yeah, and uh, yeah. especially if you're an arts organization that's maybe working with public schools, um, you can definitely look at the schools in your region and see maybe what grant funding they've received for other projects and from other places. And then you can approach them and those entities too. And it's also a really great way to get access to a lot of funders that you might not normally be able to get access to to do the educational programming that you do want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love this question from Will about uh, local funding sources, because as you know, those are more likely to come out of relationships. To, um, could you just talk a little bit about sort of the network relationship building piece of this? Uh, absolutely. Well, it's important to remember that in the end, for the most part, a grantor, again, big bad, um, you know, uh, uh, house on the hill of horrors surrounded by death and terror, um, organization, but they are people. Uh, they just they just work with a lot of, of of organizations, right? A lot of them give grants out to a lot of people. But in the end, it getting getting money from a, an organization is no different than getting it from a person. They have to trust you as people, and they either trust you in people because you you see them in person, you know them, or because you make them trust you in your writing. So I would agree, it is very much about about relationships. Yeah, and I just kind of add, you know, for us, we were we spent the better portion of our first half of our existence touring around the country, and we really didn't feel like we had um, a quote unquote home base. And so for us, making that Detroit, we just initially started performing there a lot more and developing these personal relationships and the power of personal invitations is just huge. So before we could even get a relationship with a potential funder, they should come to a concert and they should hear us and we should talk to them afterwards before they even would think about, you know, saying, hey, you, you know, have you heard? I have a family foundation. You might be a really great fit for this. You know, it's all about not coming at it straight from the, I want your money lens, you know, but introduce yourself first and what you do to them first and foremost. And then that's how the relationship uh, develops organically and can develop really strongly. Well, one of the things locally that really helps is, is actually partnering. So you do not have as many connections as all of your, uh, the, ven the venues, the artists, the other organizations you work with. So in Detroit, we have a lot of funders we work with, but we work with many, many more organizations, a lot of office uh, places, the YMCA, the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy, the parks, the art institute, uh, co-working buildings, everywhere we've performed, schools. So when you start building a reputation for the work that you do in partnering with these places, you then are able to get funding because when, when you're in a community and you're an artist, it's difficult for a funder to just say, we're gonna give money to the artist to just go out and do work. They wanna see that you are actually connected. I don't think on a local level you can have funding relationships without having other real relationships, kind of on an organizational level. Yeah. And almost all organizations and companies and schools and things in a community want you to get involved. They, they love your art, they want you to do art there. So you kind of got to start there. And if you feel like you're not a part of a community, I mean, we can speak for experience. I mean, we really felt like we didn't have a home base. And so you can literally pick the place that you want to do work and want to have an impact in and want to be a part of really out of thin air, you know, and then you can just start to build those relationships and be committed to that place and location. Yeah, <laughs> I, I just want to add a little bit on that too. I mean, if you're, if you're a nonprofit organization, this is one of the most important roles that your board of directors can play, right? Is that, is that they also have their yeah. networks. Yeah and their relationships, and that's why you want them to be on your board. Um, and if you're not a nonprofit organization, you can still create your own sort of board of directors, a, a, a small group of people who are your advisors, your supporters, your patrons who want to help you. And, and they're often 
happy to help you and sort of serve in the way that a board of directors would be, even if you're not uh, yourself a nonprofit. Uh, let's see. Um, so Claire, you sent me a, uh, a private message, but uh, she's interested in, in grants for a particular, um, uh, particular like genre of music. She's a singer. Like, is it is it worth going out and finding grants for singers, or is it more about again uh, thinking about the kinds of projects you want to do and coming at it from that angle? My my gut tells me more the latter because mm -hmm. yeah. funding for singers just seems too too specific almost. Um, yeah. And I'm actually not aware of any, nor am I certain, nor am I aware of any money for specifically for wind quintets. For just for instance, right? As, yeah. as like that's my world, and I can't even think of any. So um, I would think about Carrie mentioned um, thinking about the the ways um, thinking about the how would you put it, the areas that you work in? And the ways wedges. You can, yeah, <laughs> that you can categorize yourself. So yes, you're a singer, but if you do contemporary uh, voice, you're a contemporary artist, right? That, that's pretty broad right there. Um, if, it's, if it's, so you can think of it in terms of the genres. Think about uh, the places you like to do the work. Is it that you're doing the work for uh, in underfunded communities or in places that don't have a lot of access to the arts? Um, are you doing it on the real, real sort of high end? Is it really about the level of achievement. So now you're in a position where maybe you're not looking for vocal arts funding, but you're looking for funding for exceedingly well done projects. Are you into recording? Now you're looking for recording money. All right. So um, just basically think of it in every way except uh, being a singer, unfortunately. Uh, and I think, you know, I think you'll probably be able to, to find a lot of good stuff. But you can also look at, there others, might be, at other singers <laughs> who have gotten successful grant funding you know, kind of like we did with other contemporary ensembles and see exactly where they're being funded and how they've gotten to do the projects that they've gotten to do. And I will tell you 100% of the time, if you reach out to somebody um, and ask them these questions or ask them, hey, I, you know, I really look up to you. Can you just like spare a half an hour to chat about how you've gotten from A to B? 100% of the time, and they're going to say, oh yeah, of course, you know, let's chat. And um, so I would also encourage that, just reach out to these mentors that you might have within all these different fields. Um, if it's a singer, reach out to them, you know, any, any type of that, and they'll give you great advice and direction, you know, that you won't just find just by doing internet searches. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, a follow-up from, uh, from Will, as a nonprofit, how do you go about picking your board? That's, that's a big can of worms, but maybe. maybe. <laughs> it, it certainly is, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think to keep it brief, um, the first thing as, as regards to being a nonprofit is um, one of them, having a board of directors is required for nonprofits because boards um, govern the nonprofit. They make sure they're doing things correctly and they actually oversee. So th they're my bosses, essentially. Um, and they make sure you're doing things correctly, but they also assist and they find opportunities and they create opportunities for you. Um, so if you're, uh, and as just a oh, great point by, by Jeff, that um, if you're not remotely close to becoming a nonprofit, that doesn't mean you're not close to having a, a quote unquote board or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And you should call upon those people. I would say for Acropolis, our board is small and is made up of people that have, that are really good at what they do, and they really, really believe that what we're doing is important, and they believe in, in us. They believe in Carrie, they believe in me, that, like as people that are, and, and, and that is for us, honestly, the, the most, the most important, important thing. thing. You may hear a lot of nonprofits, you will hear, uh, talk about the main component to being a board member for an organization is your ability to get, to help create funding. To, to, to coordinate, arrange funding for the organization to help bring in new donors, things like that. Um, we just don't really use our board of directors that way. Um, we do create relationships ourselves and we have a whole network of people that help create relationships for us all the time with grantors and funders, et cetera. For the board itself, we have the five quintet members and five non-quintet members. Um, it's very intimate and very, very uh, serious. Um, and I would just suggest starting with 
people that care deeply about your success. And that you can be incredibly candid with, and they can be incredibly candid with you. And it's, you know, we started off with people that, you know, could push us in different ways at different times too. Um, so not just having everybody who's at like the same level as you are, but you can reach for some people that, you know, really inspire you and might push you in certain areas to make you do better things and, you know, try different things. So, um, but at the end of the day, they should have a very personal relationship with you. Mm -hmm. Definitely. We've got time for another question or two, if anybody has one. Well. Okay. Um, from David, interested in the story of how you became a nonprofit insights and ideas on how performing ensemble might become more involved in the community than just planning concerts. So we, um, we initially started off not organized in any way, um, just the five of us with all the money going into Matt's bank account, which was bad news. Um, so pretty quickly into it, um, we decided to become an LLC. Um, a limited, limited liability corporation, which is technically a for-profit entity, um, which basically means we could have just a separate bank account in the quintet's name um, and allowed us to funnel money into that separately so that we could save up for projects and, and keep all of the funding kind of separate from everybody individually. And we decided to transition into becoming a nonprofit in 2015 really because we started to look um, more deeply at how we wanted to last for 10, 20, 30, 50 years as a quintet together. Um, and we started to look at models of other ensembles out there um, in the industry and really just take stock of what are all the different kind of business types of these groups that, you know, have really made it a really, really long time. And so you see like the Kronos String Quartet has been a nonprofit organization for ages and um, other examples that just kind of popped up once we started doing this research and we, we really decided to take it seriously. And to kind of address the getting more involved in the community, that was one of the main impetuses um, for us wanting to become a nonprofit because we've always loved doing education work so much um, that by being a nonprofit organization, we could actually get funding and um, raise money for those exact initiatives that were locally impacted um, by what we were doing right here in Southeast Michigan. So um, it was really a, a kind of hand in hand thing that just made sense when we put all of the puzzle pieces together. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Very cool. Time for one last one. Electing a new board member, nice. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think um, you know, there was a, um, I apologize, a, on our, um, if we could share real quick, I'm doing this now, so it's probably not gonna work. Uh, and I think we just need permission again. Uh, yeah, or. Oh. That's great, you should have. Oh, there we go, sorry. Okay. Uh, oh, it didn't, didn't come in here. I had a re, oh, oh, I had a Reese. Oh, Carrie, I think you pulled up the wrong one. Well, I'll blame it. No. And eh, whatever. Okay. <laughs> the one that the, uh, the PDF that we're going to send out um, has a resource page at the bottom. Um, it's got a couple of videos of some of the projects that Carrie mentioned we've gotten mm -hmm. grant funding for. It's got um, the, uh, 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 the title uh, and author of this really amazing book. Um, <laughs> Wait for it. <laughs> um, by uh, by Gigi Rosenberg, uh, called the Artist Guide to Grant Writing. Uh, so that's that'll be in the PDF. Again, that's Gigi G I G I Rosenberg, the Artist Guide to Grant Writing. It's super great. Um, and then just some other places to go um, to find like projects that have been grant funded and things like that. So you can just kind of you know keep being inspired and, and whatnot. Um, yeah. <laughs> and or as our emails as well. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Well. Thank you both so much. And uh, please let us all give you a virtual uh, applause. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> for joining us. This has been really, really great. And, um, you know, I hope we get to work together again sometime. Yeah.
Oh, thanks so much for having us. Absolutely. And Thank you for having us. I'll just echo that if anybody wants to reach out with any follow-up specific questions, um, maybe a specific project that you're working on and you'd like our advice, you know, we're happy to help and um, good luck to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Take care. Yeah. Stay well. Yeah. Thank you, All Matt. Right. Very, it's really good. Cool. Thank you.